our uh, sessions. Okay, so salam alaikum and good morning to the class, the lecturers, and the lecturers and comrades and the distinguished guests. I'm a Dr. Adam Alibaba from Lesky Department of Faculty Electrical Engineering. Okay. Welcome and thank you uh, to you all to able to spend your valuable time to, to participate in this fifth uh, FRCB postgraduate course series webinar webinar to the topic of writing and editing uh, productively. So this webinar organized by Deputy Dean Office for the New International and Student Affairs FRCB. Right. So let me introduce. Uh, we are so honored to have Dr. Ali Rashidi here to be here with us to. He share his insight on this particular topic, right? So a little bit about Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali is a research fellow on the Future Building Initiative at Monash University, Australia. He is also a currently an active coordinator of digital project management and a leading professional research center, CRC, within Australia. And he also is an adjunct lecturer at Construction Engineering and Management at School of Engineering, Monash University in Malaysia. So, so he holding different different badges. Under the same umbrella of knowledge industries. Uh, his expertise and research interests are uh, generally on the construction informatics, construction safety, digital twin, and machine learning kit, video automation modeling, integrated design and construction management, and etc. Right, so, generally, I think more into uh, construction digital uh, informatics as well. Right. So previously, Dr. Ali with us in UPN as a senior lecturer at FRCB, right? And he did his uh, PhD integrated uh, design study here as well. And I have the chances to have a class with him under his, uh, under his uh, guidance, uh, especially on the research methodology classes together with Prof. Farina. Alright. So the today the webinar topic outline should be divided into two parts, right? So the first part on the talk about on how to write productively, which is we're going to discuss on how to create a writing habit. Uh, secondly, we're going to use a range of strategies for writing and how to deal with the writer block. Okay. So moving to the second part, we talk about how to improve your editing skills, which is we explore on what is editing is about, when you should edit, and how to edit. So I believe uh, many of you, as you see, I believe many of uh, participants here is an uh, ongoing PhD student. Many of you in the writing and editing stage of your study, and I believe some of you in post juncture in the dark, unsure, dilemma, where should I start? Am I doing it right in writing? So the good news is this is a normal, very normal for PhD student to have this thought, unsure, uncertainty, and so on. So. Take this opportunity to lend your tentative ear throughout the webinar and do ask the speaker to clear your thought and queries. Right? So, as a special instruction, is, uh, uh, there will be a QA question and answer session open to all at the end of this uh, talk session. Right? So, Dr. Ali uh, will be involved. Uh, please to answer the, all the questions pertaining uh, writing and, uh, uh, writing and uh, editing. Uh, so please say also some of your thought and question to the speaker in the chat box if any. So I try to read out some of it to the family. Right. The second thing is that uh, the host will share attendant links during the webinar session. Uh, please fill up. So during the throughout the in the middle of the webinar session, the host will give the link for for the attendance. Uh, and Please fill up because this is a uh, will be your e certificate be sent to those uh, those those fill up the attendance. All right. And lastly, the post social will upload the webinar recording in the FRCB Facebook page after the webinar. So these are the those please give the chances those that I'm going to that this presentation. Maybe we miss out some of the point. So they can see in our FRCB Faculty Record Seminar uh, Seminar uh, Facebook page. All right. After the webinar. So I think I talked a lot. <laughs> so to that, uh, let's welcome Dr. Ali. So Dr. Ali, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Dr. Adam. Uh, um, thanks a lot for your introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. Happy to be here. And I can see some of my 
uh, colleagues also attending here. Good to see you, Dr. Adam, again after a while. And uh, let me share my my screen. Uh, then we can go through that one one by one. Is it? Uh, can you see the full screen of my slide? Yes, Dr. Lee. You can see clearly. Okay, perfect. So first thing first, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope to have a, a interactive sessions. I don't want to give in the lecture here. I want to just sharing with you some of the points that normally we share in Monash University with our student. And I found it might be quite useful for you when you want to running your pathway in uh, master and PhD as a postgraduate student. And normally, sooner or later, you want to uh, become the academic staff uh, or or and researcher in industry so you might be come across this kind of issue that we call it the writing and editing and say so how to become the productive person especially you know the writing is part of your job as a, a researcher in postgraduate level so um uh, I'm a I'm a uh, research fellow and also adjunct lecturer at Monash University, and basically I want to go through that one a little bit about you what what we are doing right now in Monash University and share with you uh, two topics here today is about the writing productively about how we can create the habit of writing that is the somehow I knew you have a background of design and architecture somehow writing is a little bit difficult challenging for you so we want to share with you some strategies and also thinking process uh, for writing and if you blocking uh, or stalking at any stage how to deal with that another topic that we want to uh, cover is about the editing skills uh, that is another one uh, is quite important and we call it as an integrated part of uh, the writing which is the editing and proofreading so i'm part of the future building initiative and um, future building initiative is the lab at uh, monash university uh, basically is uh, running jointly by two faculties uh, we call it as a Monash Art Design and Architecture Faculty, or in a, in a, a abbreviation form is the MADA, and also Faculty of Civil Engineering and then specifically Civil Engineering Discipline. Uh, we have a group of colleagues here. I'm working with them very closely, uh, uh, very fantastic uh, colleagues they are working uh, in not purely in architecture not purely in engineering more or less they are in built environment and are also construction field and they are doing a lot of fantastic job right now and uh, we have a big group and also is a director of the lab is uh, prof matthew Aitchinson. And also uh, one of the big uh, achievement that we did it right now, I want to share it with you before we are starting our, uh, our topic. So the, we are working with the IT faculties, engineering, business, law, and also architecture and designs. And we are running a lot of multidisciplinary research project right now. And we are working with a lot of fantastic researchers and colleagues in other faculties. One of the initiatives uh, that recently we achieved, we, we, uh, we got the uh, research grant in 2020, we call it the uh, Building 4.0 CRC. CRC is the highest grant that is government of Australia is uh, giving for the next seven years to transforming the building industry to, to more digitalize it and the more uh, uh, automating the systems in the building industry. Uh, we got a very fantastic partners from industry and also other universities to working with us. It's around 130 million uh, 
uh, budget cost is uh, we are allocated for this uh, initiative for the next seven years. Basically, we are working for the wide range of uh, works, and I'm a part of that. Uh, we are working for uh, doing a lot of things, like even like a culture changing in the building industry, advanced building designs. Um, I'm sure most of you might be come across that as a architects, as a landscape architects, and also industrial designer. Uh, we are looking for uh, digitizations and digitalizations also in the building industry, optimizing the productions, new materials and the systems, how we can make our built environment more sustainable, and also uh, new business models uh, for the next couple of years in Australia. Uh, and beside that, uh, when uh, we have a, uh, a group of uh, industry partners, some of them might be familiar for you. We, uh, I am, I'm sure you are familiar with the land lease company. They did a lot of uh, projects in Malaysia as well. Um, I think one of them is the Exchange uh, Tower, which is the, one of the um, highest tower in the in Southeast Asia. We have other companies like a Blue Scope uh, working with us for the materials and product and development and constructions. We have other companies like Bentley Homes. And um, we have three universities all together working with each other. Monash University, Queensland University of Technology and University of Melbourne. And beside that, other industry partners and government bodies that are supporting us. We have three programs and also I'm working as a team coordinator of the digital project management under the program two, which is the digital transformation and the recent project that I'm working with other universities and industry partners is about the VRAR technologies in vocational education and training to be recently uh, granted and working with a wide range of researchers uh, to bring along the new proposal and uh, platforms for vocational education and training in Australia. So this is all about uh, me and my team in, uh, in Monash University. The first thing first I want to share with you about the writing productively. Writing the productively is not always come easily, especially for uh, for us somehow as a engineers, as a designers, as a architects, because we are very practical. We are thinking about the forms and functions, and all those kind of things, and rarely we are sit down and writing something. But it, it requires the persistence and practice. So today, I'm trying to share with you a lot of things might be is not very common to giving you uh, in the university level, because normally you go over a lot of um, skills and trainings about how to do this kind of a type of research, and definitely as a PhD candidate and. Uh, uh, master students, you you need to develop those skills. But another part, which is very important, and somehow we miss that one, is the writing. Uh, how we can do the writing? The writing is the core body of your research, and it's going to present to the wider uh, audience when you become the and the senior PhD candidate or the senior master student. You need to publish it and everybody looking at your writing and judging you based on that. So create a, a writing habit. The first thing first is the easiest one. You need to allocate the regular times to write. So it means uh, try to make them non-negotiable. So uh, once you are coming from the undergraduate to the postgraduate, uh, you need to be more systematic, putting some planning for yourself. And normally, when you are discussing with your supervisor, your committees, your the academic staff, one thing for them is very crucial is their calendar. It's always using the 
Google Calendar and put in a lot of blocks there and blocking their time for their commitments to other um, things. One of them is writing because they want to write each week and even each month for themselves to publish their research. So you need to do that one as well. Finding the regular times means weekly, daily, or even per month, you put in some blocks for your writing. Um, if, um, again, if you're not actively engaged in writing a thesis right now, you are very in a first year of your PhD or the first semester or the second semester of your master, but you need to start it. You need to start to writing uh, actually not your thesis, even if, if that one is not relevant to your thesis, it doesn't matter, but you have to start to write. Writing about piece of works that you are thinking right now. As a free writing, which I'm later on, I'm going to touch that one. You write something, one paragraph even in per day, and even something that you want to discuss it with your supervisor is quite crucial to write it down, that one, and then bring it to, your, to the office of your supervisor and the committee and discuss it. So it, it helps you to create the habit of writing. And also, oh, another thing that I want to recommend to you, make your writing and those blocks very a structured set of limited blocks of times rather than just leave it as open-ended. Some, some students, when they are coming to my, uh, to my office and then uh, I'm asking about the planning for the next couple of months of the, um, a research, they are saying every Monday I'm, I'm, I'm doing my writing. Every Monday, that is good, but this is not very structured. It is good you just put in some rules and regulation for yourself. I'm going for three hours of writing. That is a structured way that you block your calendar and everybody knows that point of times you allocated for writing. So, uh, basically, um, then later on, I will share with you some uh, some points that we have implemented in Monash, even in the timesheet of the research assistance and also all the students who got the scholarship, how we are managing the blocks of times and uh, might be useful for you. Um, and other things is quite um, important for you. Uh, we are humans and we have to find when you are most productive in writing, when you are, um, uh, you are a day person or the night person, uh, that, then you find those most productive time and block it and put it for the hard writing. The hard writing should be happen when you are in a good mood, you are most productive and do the writing at that point of times and leave other times for proofreading, editing, and other things that is not really needs the brain functioning. So for uh, creating the habits, whatever you decide to do, as I mentioned here is a couple of things, couple of a strategy to create a writing habit, whatever you want to create doing, and uh, give it a time to go. So it means you can't be a very good writer uh, by simple strategy that I'm sharing here. You need to do some persistence and practice. So habits, as always, takes time to establish. So in order to create that kind of habits, we need to prepare ourselves. First thing first, we need to uh, uh, create a regular work a space, especially at, at this point of times, uh, we are working from home. And then uh, you need to create a regular work space with everything you need on hand. So make sure that the space is quite comfortable and you are uh, comfortable to just blocking the time and then staying there and do your writing. And 
make sure is another thing that is is very important when you want to create that habits you don't be stared by the phone calls social media and those kind of things that every day create a lot of distraction for us you are researchers you are students in postgraduate levels you need to put some resistance in the um, a little bit distraction here. I think one of the mic is open. Yeah. So it's another things. Um, we need to put a set of a specific goals. Beside the structured block of time that you're creating in your calendar, you need to put the specific goals. What do you want to do at that specific block of times? For example, you're putting the, I'm writing the 500 words, expanding the, for example, that theory in my research. I want to go in and Googling and doing and writing the 500 words for, for that specific outline in my chapter. Or you might, you might be, you are in the analysis part right now. You are a senior student. You say, I want to summarize in the contribution of that, those uh, theories. So I'm allocating, I, I should write it down at least 300 words in during that block of times. So put the goals for yourself. Then it's going to help you a lot because you need to achieve that one and put the checkbox there and you get very happy at, at the end of your block of time. So at the end of the session, don't leave your desk. So you just stay there, write down what you need to do in the next time. So when you're coming back to the desk next time, might be next Monday, next Tuesday, uh, whatever is your planning, write down what you need to do. So it is good you, you learn this kind of systematic way because it's going to help those that habits and those habits that you need to create during during your pathway in postgraduate even our our academic colleagues they already used to that so they know how to do these kind of things so it is good you matching yourself with the style of ac academy because sooner or later you are going to the industry become the researcher or maybe you become the new lecturer in other universities as well. For writing, I wanna share with you some strategies. Strategies for writing, because we deal uh, with writing every day and uh, um, for PhD candidates, normally three years or four years, they need to sit down and do the writing. Even the master by research is uh, at least is around the two years. And uh, writing is not a stopping by your graduation. After the graduation, you, I think to me, my personality, we, you require that one more and more even after the graduation. So if some people, they don't have any problem putting the words on a page. Others might be the struggle with the, where to start, how to put the words together. Some of them, some, and they have a language barrier. Some of them might be English is not the, uh, it's not the first language of them, it's a second language. And then this kind of a struggle, and some of them might be, as I told you, they are practitioners, they are coming from the industry, they never sit down and do the writing especially our practitioners in engineering, in architecture, they, they never come across this kind of habits. So they have some struggle. Let me show you another side of that. Another side is the experienced writers, academic writers. Let me show you one of the secret things. Even our academic writers, experienced writers, somehow they have the same problem. They have the same um, uh, uh, struggle that you come across it. And then 
if you come up, um, if you sit down with them, they never use the very same and similar techniques at the every stage of writing. They have a different approach, different strategy to do the writing. But even you are the early career researcher in Monash, we call it the ECR or the experienced writers, they all agree that you need to separate the composition and from the editing. This is the main message that when you want to start in your writing, you want to write your thesis, you want to write your paper, you cannot do simultaneously composition or the writing with the editings. You need to put some gaps, put it separately, do your writing, and then jump into the editing. So uh, here, I want to just share with you some techniques for writing. We call it as a pre-writing thinking process. Can might be helping you to draft the very unpolished um, statements. Then, uh, then after that, you can jump in and editing that. The first technique is the free writing. My majority of you are familiar with that, but the free writing means a day to day, and you can use that techniques. Even if you've been into um, to industry or undergraduate levels, in order to unlock your thinking process, you need to write it down. That free writing, it doesn't matter is academic or the casual day to day writing, but you need to write. You need to write it down few sentences and a few statements per day or per week. In order to that free writing is going to help you to just create some thinking process. And when you are thinking too much, your brain functions is using the working memory and putting a lot of thoughts and thinking together. That is not good for you. Some of you might be as a, a students, keep thinking about your research, but that is not good a strategy. You need to bring it down and put it on the paper. So in free writing, you're trying to transfer in whatever you are thinking to the writing style. And you can suggest things by the simple things like a teams for an outlines in the earlier stage, um, some of you, when you are starting your PhD, when you're discussing with your supervisor, you want to do the outlining. You put in some themes, what I'm trying to do in my literature review, what I'm trying to do in my background study and introductions. So in free writing, you can sketch it and you can just do some drafting here and producing some points, dot points together and discuss it with your committees and saying, I want to do this kind of thing. What, what do you think about that? So it, it shows how do you think about your um, um, research and your journey in PhD and your supervisor committee also getting the whole concept. Is it on the right track or you need to tailor it down? So once you have those kind of points, you jump into another technique is about mind mapping and brainstorming. Mind mapping is also a little bit more systematic. When you have the points and the teams, what you can do, you can create some connection. That connections, we call it the mind mapping and brainstorming. You can sit down with your classmates, with the seniors, even with the juniors, discussing and saying, okay, these are my points in the chapter two. These are my points in chapter one. And I want to do this kind of background studies. What do you think about these kind of subheadings and constructs that I, I developed? Do you think there is a connection between them? And create the connections and present it to your committee again. Again, that one is, is helping you to one step you go forward in the writing. So mind mapping, we have a lot of online platforms. You don't need to do that one. If you like, you can sketch it on the paper, 
but you can go through there are a lot of platforms, online platforms, putting all these um, um, major topics and also putting some subtopics over there and create the connections. So um, these are the uh, free writing and brain assuming. When you have the mind mapping and brain assuming the free writing, it goes to another level that we call it outlining. This level is very crucial for all PhD and master students and postgraduate students. This is the very important part. When you wanna publish in your journal, when you wanna go for thesis writing, you need to do a proper outlining. Proper outlining shows the systematic and the big picture of your writing. So at this level, the easiest one, you coming back to the word, Microsoft Word that everybody right, right now is using that, there is a section of outlines you can create it, creating the topics, subtopics, and any components under that, and shows the very systematic relationship and then the structure of your thesis or the paper. So um, basically, uh, these are very important free writing, mind mapping, and outlining for those who want to kick start the writing of the thesis, chapters, or the journal paper. Another, another sections that we, and a strategy and techniques that we wanna use for our writing is the writing to prompts. You remember when you start your uh, free writing, brainstorming, and even the outlining, you put in a lot of dot points and saying these are the dot points that I created. And you discuss with your committee, you discuss with your friends and colleagues and your classmates. Um, so once you have those kind of things, the, the first step that you can start, because some of you might be struggling how to start my writing, what you can do, change the dot, dot points to the simple and easy statements. For example, here, we want to turn a point into a sentence starter as an importance of the context. For example, one of the dot, uh, dot points that you have it in your uh, research. Easily, you can transform it to the, the context is important because then you can continue your writing. So your brain is a start to working, adding two lines or three lines, two sentences until you bundle it up and make it as a one a structure statements uh, or mini paragraph. So writing to prompts is a key start of the writing. We bring it down all the points and then it's starting to write. Again, uh, we have another one uh, we call the timed writing. Might be some of you heard about the Pomodoro techniques. That one, it means uh, breaking the writing sessions. When I'm saying I want to do my writing on every Mondays, it is not good to sit down and do the six hours of writing. That is not very productive. Writing sessions should be break down, and a lot of researchers, they propose that one when they, you're coming back to the psychology or the brain functioning of the humans, it is, um, is mainly, it's good you just break it down into the sections with the short breaks. Means in the Pomodoro techniques, they are saying 25 minutes writing, then five minutes break. Let me show you one of the strategy that we have it in Monash. In Monash, any research assistants, anybody is uh, joining us as uh, researchers, students with a scholarship uh, coming, and, uh, coming on board and they want to do their research. Um, I'm telling them to my students, if you're going and putting into the system of the timesheet and saying, oh, I was working six hours, then system, automatically is thinking about your well-being and health is not going to accept it. So 
if you put in the six hours in Monash, you will not get the paid of the six hours. Monash is going to say the time sheet is saying that every three hours you need a half an hour break. So it means six hours claim means one hour of that is spread and it's unpaid. So it is good you, as, um, again, you following the, uh, the compliance and then the structure of the working. So they put something into the system as a logic of the system. In order to force you every 25 minutes, giving the five minutes break for yourself, then your uh, the brain is is refreshing and again you can start the writing. You can go get a cup of coffee and coming back to your desk and again and start the writing. So you can create this kind of a strategy and techniques for yourself. And also if we have another strategy, uh, we call it the writing with others or among the others. In future building initiative in our lab, every Friday, all my colleagues, even colleagues, not their students, we all get together for a few hours. We know we are too busy with the teaching, too busy with a lot of uh, research activities and um, supervisions. So if we put a block of time, we, um, that is, they call it the shut up and write. So what we are going to do, um, we put them um, doing the mingling around and doing the social discussion or even over the Zoom, uh, then starting the writing, doing our job, 30 minutes of job, and then uh, five minutes of that is the break time. Again, doing that. So you can search that one in, in, in the faculty or might be in the, in the group of friends. If they have that kind of things, you can assault that. You can put in the allocating the times. We are doing every Friday. We want to get together. At least we can just during the pandemic time, we can share uh, whatever is happened during the week and then start the writing and pushing ourselves. And that time is blocked only to concentrate on the writing. So this is a very good strategy also. I hope you got something out of that. These are the key start of the writing for yourself in order to create that kind of habits. And then uh, we have some uh, blockage. We have some challenges. If the writers get blocked in somewhere, get stuck with something, what should we do? Even if you have a very good writing habits and usually using those techniques that I, uh, I told you, might be your writing is not getting very smoothly. That is very common. Don't get panic, especially those of you who are quite new in the research environment. Writing is always not a smooth way. So uh, it is common to get a start time to time. Any, at any stage of your writing in your PhD or master journey. So what do you want to do? So if you're not getting the very uh, right connections, what you need to do between the wordings and writing the statements, you need a little bit of step back from the writing the sentences and think about the planning. Think about that. Uh, so if you're not, uh, you're not well uh, a writer in connecting the statements together, sentences together to create the paragraph, a little bit of step back, coming back and do the planning again. And try to just, again, come back to that, try to write it down again, or might be revise it. And also is another one, uh, might be that one is not work out, uh, the order of your writing with your ideas. Somehow we have a thousand of papers. So it's open up on your system and you want to review the papers and summarize it and put it on the chapters. So when you want to write in that one or even in your paper, then you're realizing the orders of the writing is not good enough. It's not really fit. It's not properly put into the orders because you're jumping from one side to another side and then coming back to that, which is not good. And then 
unfortunately this is one of the area that you are getting rejected when the reviewers looking at that and then see you don't have a very consistent or the flow in your writing again you need to come back and set back yourself from the writing and going back and look at that in a big picture and see um, uh, how do you want to do the reordering or maybe you bring along those statements on a very big piece of paper and doing some mind mapping again you remember i told you create the connection and say this statement should become first that another one is coming second and then another one is a uh, is the third one so create the mind mapping connections and come back to the writing style and also somehow the words are not precisely uh, used in your writing because you're supposed to use the formal academic writing. We are not writing the email to the friend. We are writing something in a formal way. And also, most of you are coming from the, because here is uh, your majority of you from the Faculty of Design and Architecture. You have a background of landscape, architecture, design, industrial design. So you need to use the technical words in your field. So you need to, again, coming back, looking at the academic style that you have, cross-checking with other papers. And you, we are not supposed to use the, you know, the very common words. We have to use the technical words. And um, checking that one, is it related to the idea that we want to present it? Or somehow the synonyms, it doesn't give the, the same meanings in the academic writing. So we need to be careful about that. So uh, actually, um, sometimes the best course of action for uh, any blockage is to take a break from the problem that you have it and let your unconscious mind working on that. So unconscious mind still is working on that. Give a break to that. Make a cup of coffee, as I told you, and go for a walk here. Here is very common. Everybody going for a walk and running and coming back to the desk. And then again, start the writing. So before jumping to the second topics, um, this is a little bit activity for you. I just want to give you the two or uh, two minutes. Just write down, take a note of these points. Might be later on during the Q&A sessions. I want to listen to some of the participants who are working right now on the thesis or doing the, any publications and might be sharing with us about that this is um, this activity is related to the strategies the habits that i shared with you here so um, if you don't mind you take a note of uh, the, those questions and then briefly might be shared with us during the q a session So by the way, Dr. Adam, is there any question, any inquiry for this first part of our workshop? But I just want to maybe ask you some question. Um, I think uh, you know that uh, software they use, some of the software, they write skill boards, grammary. So all these some of the software that you have in the market that they say they may help the writing to that side of the phone. So what do you think on this? Do you re heavily rely on this or should we just uh, be like oh, you, uh, if I'm if I'm getting right, you mean about the Grammarly and other available online software yeah. for for writing. 
basically uh, the Grammarly and other uh, practical software that available on the market mainly is going to use for the second part of this workshop, which we call it as editing and proofreading. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to cover that on the second part, but I'm, I'm not in a brief uh, response to that questions. Uh, we can't 100% rely to the software. Mm -hmm. So the writing style is, uh, and also especially academic writing is quite important that uh, you are looking at that because software somehow doesn't have that kind of pre-programming to say that kind of wordings that is going to suggest to you, is it relevant to the architecture? Is it relevant to the landscape? Is it relevant to you to the design? Or maybe it's giving you some suggestions that might be misleading your audience. That's why I'm, I'm saying that we need to be careful, especially about the techni technicality that I'm sharing later on with you about mm -hmm. uh, the wordings that is going to suggest by the Grammarly or other softwares. Yep. Um, do you think uh, we can go on with another sections if everybody um, write down uh, those questions? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, uh, the audience maybe can take the pictures so you can look at the camera. Yep, exactly. Let's take a small one. This this team already take the pictures. Okay. So yep. This one we're gonna go through after the second part. So, uh, yep. Then we can later on we can get some volunteer to share with us about the their thesis. Okay, so the, the second part, so we created the habits and we know right now what is writing. But the writing is not a stopping there and that, that is not the major and the main component of your research study. Some of you might be thinking, you know, as long as I'm writing down something on a paper and give it to my supervisor, giving that I want to my supervisory committee, that's enough. Um, unfortunately, that is not uh, the major component of the research writing. We have another section, we need to improve our skills that we call it the editing skills. Improving uh, the editing skills that here to me is equal to the writing style. So when you are doing the very good writing style, it still is not mature enough. You need to edit it. So here I want to share with you the three stages or three main uh, stages that the editing process need to go through that one. That's why I create a very simple and systematic way that you can capture it and then might be you apply it for your research writing in future. These are, by the way, these are the common themes that our students here also in Australia is going through that one. And then they are using this kind of uh, skills when they are writing the thesis or the uh, paper. Because paper writing is the crucial and is important for each HDR, we call it here HDR, all postgraduate students in Monash. And this is a requirement for them to publish in the high index Q1 uh, ISI journal. So they need to improve their writing, editing skills, or whatever is relevant to that. So um, basically, uh, we want to uh, look at the, what editing is and when you should do the editing and how to edit it. So basically, when you are going through to uh, the writing and also uh, you need to jump to the editing file. So editing uh, the statements is another uh, stage of your writing. 
As you can see at the right hand side, I put a cycle here for you. You need to first organizing your, your component of your research, do the writing, then editing, then you need to do the proofreading. And once you, you completed that one, you pass it to the reader, get some feedback. It can be the reader, your, your supervisor, it can be somebody else, but it is good to just pass it and get some feedback, think about it, put some reflections and revise it again. So this is a loop that you have it in your pathway as a postgraduate students. So before we are starting the editings, I wanna share with you some tips and tricks. So one of them is, it is, it is best to put aside your writing for a day or two before starting the editing. So it means if you finish your editing, uh, writing, sorry, and when you start, uh, finish the writing, it is not recommended to do the uh, editing immediately. Again, that one comes back to your prior knowledge, brain functionings. It is good you give a break, leave it aside, and then come back to that. And uh, another, another tips and tricks for editing, print out the hard copy of your research paper or thesis, and then do the editing on top of that, rather than using the, uh, the software. I will tell you why. So what is editing in, in the research? Editing is always is a process of correcting, altering, modifying a written text in preparation for the wider disseminations, such as publication, the common one. You need to publish, you need to publish. Otherwise, nobody knows about your research. You need to publicize yourself. You need to show your, your research value to the bigger audience around the globe. So you need to publish it. Before that, you need to edit it. You make it ready for your your uh, the, the bigger cohort or the size of audience that they are in, in your field and they want to listen to you and they want to read your research so it is good you correcting and modifying the written uh, text editing is always uh is important uh, because that one is the breach the process of drafting a piece of writing. You remember we, we told you do the composition, put the uh, words together and create with some strategy, some, some line of statements. And then another side of that, you need to formally present in that one as a part of the journal publication or the thesis publications to the wider audience. Absolutely, you are as a um, UPMS student if you want to publish in that one, sooner or later, that one is, the, is in the repository of the library. And everybody around the globe might be searching your name, your topic of your research, or the abstract, or whatever is, is, uh, is publicly free for everybody. And they want to see the content of your research. And it is very important. You make you ready for the bigger, uh, audience that you have it. Editing is always employed whenever the written text needs to be shared beyond the um, author. If you are the only person that you want to go through that one, maybe you say, I don't need any editings, but jumping one step further and you want to share it with others, it is good to adding the editing part of your writing. And might be you asking the very common questions. Do I need to do the editing only for my, my research study in a master or PhD? No, that one is not limiting to your university environment. So beyond the university environment, editing is using every day in your daily jobs after your graduations. You're required to write the emails piece of reports to the to your 
assessment to your manager, even in, in the university uh, faculty or somebody is asking some piece of papers or a report that you need to present it. So if you have any stakeholders in the university or you might be publishing one uh, white paper uh, as part of your uh, research uh, activities in your lab in, in future, so you need to edit it first and then put it for uh, on the website. So it is it's not limiting to your uh, thesis writing or the general publication. Uh, it is the, um, that's why I'm saying that, that is the uh, skills that you need to learn and develop it in yourself uh, for the future uh, career. So you you might be heard the people uh, some somehow they use the synonyms and some other terms for this stage. We call it here editing. Some people are saying revising, proofreading. In this workshop, revising is part of the editings and is synonym to each other. Proofreading is the last stage of editing. So again, editing in this workshop, we make it uh, into the three stages. The last stage of that is proofreading, which we call it the stage three. So regardless of the terms that you come across it, when you're Googling anywhere and then you're going to other workshops and then trainings, uh, of course the proofreading, editings, and also writing is a integrated to each other and they are integral part of each other so you need to create the habits of writing then a skill of uh, editing and proofreading so i want to share with you something because somehow a little bit um confusion with um especially for young uh uh, students when they are going for the postgraduate level, it doesn't matter in UPM or some other universities. You get some written feedbacks from your supervisor that is going to help you in your um, editings. But I want to tell you, even if you are doing your PhD uh, in Malaysia or some uh, any other countries. The, the person who is the uh, main, uh, having the main responsibility, or we call it as a primary responsibility for editing is you, because you are the writer. You are the person who are driving the research. In Monash, the students having the uh, full of right on the piece of writing of the research. So you control that one. So you are a writer, so you're supposed to take the responsibility of editing and other things. That's why it is good we develop our skills uh, before we go for any publications or uh, graduation of our research thesis. How do you wanna do the editings? That is the common questions. That's why I'm sharing with you three stages. The stage one, we call it as a big picture very easy one. The stage one of editing is uh, focusing on the meaning and the context of the piece of writing that you are examining. So meaning and the context of the piece of writing is very important as part of the big picture of your uh, uh, thesis or uh, research paper. In, in this stage, you are looking to ensure that communicates the idea clearly and fits properly within the larger body of uh, work, which is your thesis or might be paper. Uh, whether that one is a paragraph uh, in relationship to a uh, section or the sections to the chapter or chapter to the whole body of your thesis. We are looking for the big picture is the meaning of our each components. If you have a question saying, how about the relationship and the connection between the sentences, that one is going for the next step, which is we call it as a stage two or middle view. 
with the stage one, the key questions that you can keep it in your mind and when you wanna examine and evaluating your writing. You remember I told you, you print out that one as a hard copy, put yourself and judge your writing. How does this piece of writing relate to the world as a whole? This is the main question that you can put it on the, on the table and asking from yourself. If you write it down paragraph or the section, how does that one is related to the, to the whole body of your chapter or the work that is might be your paper or the thesis? So once you have that one, other questions that you might be putting as a part of your evaluation when you wanna eat editing. These are the questions that any editors is going to ask when you submit your piece of writing. What is the function of this piece of writing in the overall work? That is the common questions. Are you introducing the topic or giving the background information? Are you arguing in the particular position or presenting the evidence? You remember this, this part mainly in chapter one and two, you, you are struggling a lot. You're giving the background about something, you are arguing about a particular position or theory or presenting some evidence or we call it the citations, justifications. Do you, do you uh, cover those kind of things? And then again, if you covered, how well did you cover that one? How well did you fulfill that function? Is it uh, clear to, uh, to relate to the bigger picture? When you have that paragraph, that sections, is it um, a good connected to other parts of your thesis? Is it supporting other part of your thesis or not? Does it actually communicate what you think it should communicate? You know, somehow we are thinking as architects or engineer, we say, oh, it should be running like that, should be giving this kind of message. But when you write it down, there is a different meaning or somehow a little bit confusion for your readers. So make sure whatever you are thinking, whatever you are thinking, it should be happen, uh, is already drafted. Here in, uh, in Monash, they call the thesis or the paper, uh, they, they put the visual diagram for that. If you are considering the thesis as a tree and um, your research can be grown up by finding some gaps. You remember the first day that you joined, you presented your problem, that is the gap. And then uh, when you have that one, you're going through the research, uh, creating the research questions. And research questions is driving the branches. And that branches can be called as a chapters. And each chapters is going to give us some uh, sections and also um, because each branch having the different type of branches that you can see in the trees and then uh, giving the sections and in particular each leaf can be a one paragraph. So if we are transforming the thesis to the tree, we have to think in very systematically when we are writing down our thesis and editing that one. In a bigger picture, these kind of questions is helping you, you draw the tree very well. And then in a stage two and three, I will show you how do you wanna make sure each branches each leaves is designed very well. So um, I, I actually, uh, again, when I'm saying in the bigger picture as a final statement here, each paragraph should clearly support the section and the, um, each section um, going to support the chapters and chapters all together going to support your thesis. We have the same scenario in paper writing. A stage two that we call it the middle view. When you undertake the stage two editing, we are not leaving the stage one, 
put it aside. No, we don't uh, do that one. So we run it concurrently. It means you are focusing on the meaning and context in a stage one. You remember the bigger picture of your writing that you are examining. Beside that, you need to focus in, in detail on the coherence and clarity of the sentences in paragraph. So a little bit, you are narrow down, focusing on each paragraph. You remember in the diagram, I told you each leaf, we consider, consider it as a paragraph. So in each leaf, we are looking for the coherence and clarity of sentences. Um, basically with a stage two, the key question again, you need to put it on the table is how does each sentence relate to other sentences? within the paragraph. So again, uh, we want to ask in these common questions, each sentence that we drafted, putting some words together, how that one is related to other sentences to create a paragraph. So you can see from the, this, again, from this diagram, when we are talking about the linking the sections together, linking the paragraph together, those parts is all about the context and meanings, which, uh, which is on the uh, stage one or big picture. And also uh, links between the sentences, we call it the middle view, and in the loop at the right hand side, all of them is related to each other. That's why I'm telling you stage one and two running concurrently. When you are starting the stage two, you need to consider again, like a stage one, as a reviewer, as a um, person who is um, examining and uh, writing, you need to put some questions, very simple one. Are there any logical connection between the points of arguments? Does that one uh, need a little bit fill out? You need to put in something and if you find any misconnection between the, this line and another line, do you need to fill out? Because there is no logical connection. So you need to go sentences by sentences, statement by a statement and checking the connections. Because we are not going to report, we are not going to put in some, some students they are considering, they are putting their um, line by line without any connections that is become the literature review or maybe it's become uh, the, uh, another chapters. No, each connections is very important. Statement by statement should be supporting each other. For example, in terms of evidence, does the evidence support what is supposed to support? You know, evidence is always like a justification, like a citation that you have it when you, when you want to saying something in your writing, you need to make sure there is evidence for that. Because this is a common, again, question from your examiner might be in uh, when you are going for uh, why war or defending your PhD or master, they will ask you, you mentioned about the 50 participants in your experimental study. Do you have any evidence? So make sure when you do the write-up, it means that questions from the boards or the examiners, it means there was a lacking of the stage two in your writing. So make sure you have an enough evidence, then there is no question from the boards. Uh, again, the relevance, does every point contribute to the arguments? For example, when you write down the few lines of the statements and you create a paragraph, Somehow, we are as a reviewer right now in the uh, when reviewing the paper, we find this line and another line in the, is not relevant to that arguments. Why they put it there? You want to just filling out a few lines there and just patching together? No. So that's why we call it as a redundancy somehow. So this is very common for the students who are doing the first draft of writing, a lot of redundancy means a lot of similarity, a lot of overlaps. So you need to, um, when you're repeating something few times, is not showing the value or the 
the strong point of your writing. Somehow that one is the lack, and you need to you need to be careful about that. Again, the language, are you using the right words, expression? Coming back to the questions about the Grammarly or other softwares. Somehow, some students just rely into the software and that software is automatically changing some words. But that unfortunately, especially for, for my field, for example, I'm using the IT technology in, the, in the building constructions like a virtual reality, augmented reality, external reality, or even other technology in this game or building information modelings. But tell you the truth, software not helping me because virtual reality itself is one word. My video is going to give you one suggestion that is not totally unrelevant. So you need to make sure you, you are using the right words and expression, especially technical expressions. And that is coming from your side because you are the expert, you are the architects, you are the engineers, and you know what is the proper word uh, to use in that statements. So and another one is the very, very common one is the lens or uh, are the sentences too long or too short. That is very common. Those who are writing down, especially they are very novice uh, in writing, somehow they are too long or might be too short in terms of writing. So we need to create the games, the very systematic of the flow of writing, create the habit of writing very, very concise and coherent and, and put the clarity into that. I'm going to share with you some, uh, again, the activities to the specific part of the stage two. The first one, um, editing for the coherence. Um, you know, for the first stage of the activity, when you are, each sentence in your paragraph needs to contribute to the purpose of the paragraph. You remember that one is I, a couple of times I mentioned that one because um, uh, every sentence need to logically connect it to others to give a, a bigger uh, picture meaning of the, the paragraph. Otherwise, the purpose or the meaning of the overall paragraph will be unclear and confusing to your readers. Checking to ensure all the sentences in your paragraph are logically um, connected, and this is a very important step. Just coming back to that diagram. If you are considering the paragraph as a leaf, you know the introductory sentences uh, when you are starting your paragraph uh, in the leaf is just the spine of or the point of the leaf. So you need to have a topic sentence. You, you need an introductory sentence. Um, very um, saying that one, even from when I'm reviewing the paper in um, in good journals, somehow I'm, uh, I can see even the, they have a very good research in other universities, I can see there is a missing of the introductory sentence or a topic, we call it the topic sentence. Um, I can see a lot of construct or subtopics put in together without any introductory sentences. So introductory sentences or the topic sentence is very important because it's giving you that topics, defines the overall purpose and the point of the paragraph. So um, when, you, when you put in the topic sentence, then the rest of uh, lines or the statements, uh, we call it as a vein of the uh, a leaf, which is going to uh, flash out uh, some uh, explanations and also comments and somehow backed up by the evidence. You remember you mentioned uh, we discussed about the justifications. You put it here. So explanations, comments, evidence, some arguments and linking to each other. So um, these are the main body of the paragraph. 
That's why you need to edit, edit each paragraph in terms of coherence. And you need to consider uh, these kind of uh, steps when you want to write it down. So um, if you find any, any part is already missed, you need to adding or amending to that. So uh, a little bit not saying time consuming, but you need to focus on that paragraph by paragraph and going towards the end. Another step is editing for clarity. And so as a student, you often uh, need to use the technical expression. You remember I told you about that. And um, you need to present the uh, complex ideas because you are architects, you want to use the top notch technologies and you want to use a lot of technical expressions and presenting the complex ideas. So um, a little bit, if you are not aware about the editing for clarity, you might be uh, writing for you a, a, and you do the writing a little bit difficult for your reader, especially for your uh, uh, supervisor committee. So uh, this part is going to help you to make it clear even you want to sharing very complex idea. So what makes writing easy to read? Um, the important of uh, the important things. Again, I want to talk about the brain functionings, working memories. You need to find who is your audience. Who will be reading your paper? Who will going to get in touch with your thesis? So that one is very important. And this come, uh, if you're not aware about that, you need to sit down with your committee, supervisory committee and discussing, do I need to explain this kind of things? Do I need to talk about those kind of things and, and giving uh, some explanations rather than using a very difficult technical expression and complex idea that is making more difficult. And even your reviewer, editorial board of journals, and then they don't understand what you are trying to say. So, this one is influenced by the choice of terms that you are using, how densely you can pack in the information and ideas together, and how much explaining you need to do. So basically, um, in this step, uh, for uh, in middle view, we have a common problems among the writers and the researchers. Um, um, so if even as a student, as you come across the very long and complex sentences, or you, we can come across the um, um, students is using the many words when um, even one word can be giving that meanings. They are putting a lot of words together as synonym to each other in order to explain something. And somehow they are densely packed information or data to each other. So these are the three things. It's very long and complex sentences. Using many words instead of uh, giving a very simple word to, to deliver that me uh, message. Or densely packing the information or data. So I don't want to make it just a one way. Uh, what we can do, we have our Q and A sessions. Uh, I want to share with you one activity, and I, I want to get one uh, a volunteer just responding to that. This is a one statement as a research statement that is uh, wrote by one student. So. Can you tell me when you wanna you, you acting as an editor or a student you wanna edit in that one? What is the main problem right now? What is the problem, common problem in this statement? This is a singular statement. And what is your solution for that? So can I have one uh, one volunteer here? Feel free to switch on your videos and then we can have a more interactive session. What I'm, I'm trying to do here, I don't want to just deliver in a very boring um, workshop, uh, a little bit giving the pause here. 
we are towards the end of the workshop. So I, I want you to at least get something out of this workshop. So if we are jumping to the editing for clarity. And sooner or later, you will write down something might be similar to this. If you have this one and your supervisor put in the comments and saying, oh, there is a there is an issue here. So can you tell me what is the issue? I'm not quite familiar with the WebEx, but I'm not sure that um, we have our participants. Uh, they can switch on the video or they can interact with us or not. Okay, Adam, um, anybody volunteer here? Yep. What is the main issue behind this uh, piece of writing? Um, Okay, I'm doctor. Okay. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor Ali. My name is yeah, uh, Hamu. Yeah. Uh, I think the main issue, or one of the main issue, is uh, linking between sentences, and even the grammatically mistakes. I think that's my first yeah. uh, notice. Yeah, that, that's that's good. Um, but when we are focusing on the editing for clarity, as you mentioned, the main issue behind this uh, piece of writing is uh, we can say uh, that is too long. Am I right? When you want to write it down something and you want to read it as an editor, and you want to understand what is the main. Uh, uh, idea behind this piece of writing is a little bit too long. So you remember when I come back to our uh, the main problems that we have for editing for clarity. The first thing first is is too long and complex. So as a suggestion, if we considering that one too long, do you know what is the solution for that? The first solution is we need to find a place to break it up. So if you are an editor acting as an editor or the research student, if your supervisor put in the comments and saying this sentence too long, go back and revise it. And you want to edit it for him because that one is not clear. And it's a little bit complex and confusing. So you find a logical place to break it up. Just sharing with you, the I can see that a statement can be break into two separate statements in the sentences. So when you're going coming back to the, the green one, you can see. The 13th and 15th centuries is can be a, this is can be a one sentence, then a full stop, then you jump into another statement. Rather than we are saying that with a comma, that, when, which, and linking a lot of things together, make it more complex. We don't want to go in for very detail because um, our friend here he mentioned about the grammar. That one is the one stage further, we call it as a proofreading. Even we don't want to consider that one. Uh, again, uh, we need to look at uh, basically that one is too long. If that one is too long, how we can break it up. So one of the tips, when you want to see a very long st statement. Is it that one is long or not? Read that sentence aloud. Loudly, you read that statement. If you run out of breath before you get to the end, it's too long. 
So if you wanna, if you can go for uh, that one, you read it aloud and check your breath. If you can just uh, with the full stop, you have a normal inhale and exhale and breathing, that, that one is good enough. That's perfect, all good, you can go for it. But if that one is not, it means there is an issue be behind that. So this is one tips and tricks for uh, checking your writing when you wanna editing for clarity because normally some students is giving the piece of writing to somebody else is doing the editing for them. So editor put in this kind of a strategy and they are loudly reading your, your statements and see, oh, that's too complex and uh, long. Why you're not break it up into the simple statements rather than you put in the complex one. Another activity, again, we, uh, still we are under the editing for clarity. Here, it, it seems it's not very long because um, the statement is a brief review of the second language pedagogy literature, provides a perspective as to why, blah, blah, blah. And this question is complex and has many ramifications. Can you tell me, even this one is to me is not very long. But still, you got a comment from your committee and even from somebody that who already reviewed for you. Can you tell me what is the issue behind that? Why you got that kind of uh, comment? Any idea? Any idea from the flow? Okay, so if uh, if you want to know what is the issue here, again, we don't propose the long and complex statement, but it's too wordy. You can find the few words together. For example, when we are going to revise it and give it to the editor, in terms of saying that provides a perspective as to why, it can be say indicates why. You, you don't need to put in a lot of words together to give him one meaning. And even in the second statements, you're saying this question is complex and has many ramifications. You can say this question is complex. That's all. You don't need to, or you might be saying this question has many ramifications. It's quite similar to each other. That's why I'm saying if one word is delivering the message, why you want to use the another word to support that one? I had one undergraduate student here in my time in Monash uh, um, in um, another department. Um, he was a fantastic student. He was a, a top student in undergraduate. He was doing his final year project with me. And he published eventually his uh, undergraduate work in a very top-notch journal. So he was a very capable person, but he was not a writer. He was trying to put a can everywhere. He's using the can everywhere. I was like, why you want to use in that one everywhere to support in your statement? And even at the end of the statement, he just put in that. And I told him, I think you need to very uh, consider the major, put in the major barrier for yourself and don't use the can anymore. Don't use it and leave it that side. And then say, say, what do you want to, what, what do you want to say? That's why he revised that paper and he published that. So we need to be careful when we want to use in the words, somehow we want to supporting and putting too many words together. But instead of that, that's why I'm saying in the first draft, you leave it aside, get back after the break, and then look at that word by word. Then you will really realizing, might be just saying the indicate 
that's a good enough for you. Or maybe just as a second statement, you're saying this question is complex, that's it. You don't need to say and, 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 and. Few ands in one statement, that is all giving the same meaning. So um, again, that, that is another tips that I told you is um, you don't need to use the two words when one of them will do the job. Again, uh, we have another uh, activity. We call it as a, uh, this one is again, do you think is it too wordy or maybe it's too long? Um, here, uh, we call it as a, um, I can go through that one. There is a debate on whether initial language proficiency assessment is an accurate future academic performance predictor. So if I'm reading that one loudly, what did you get from my reading? So here, one of the things that you, you realize, once I, I reached towards the end, you found there's a lot of dancing. You put in a lot of uh, dense uh, it, when you want to present in some expression, some technical words. So um, the suggestion here is there is a debate on whether initial language proficiency assessment accurately predicts the future academy performance. So we change the noun to the verb, and then you can see easily, rather than putting the few words together, make it dense, uh, a little bit we revise it, make it more meaningful. So, and then uh, when you come across those kind of things, for example, we um, somehow, even we are using a lot of terminology, virtual reality, building information, modeling, blah, 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 few words, few nouns together. You can a little bit twist it, change it, and then uh, change the noun forms into the verb forms in order to make it more uh, meaningful. The stage three, the last stage that we have it after stage two is a middle view. Uh, when we done our meaning, context, coherent, and clarity, um, you need to make sure your work fits within the required academic convention and the styles. This allows your work to be presented in accurate and consistent fashion, which aids the reader's comprehension of the text. Just sharing with you, some students, they are feeling that the stage is the final stage. Or maybe some of them considering, okay, this is my final semester works. But I can tell you, um, if you're running, if you're running your editing, for example, the stage one and two, it is good somehow you start these kind of things that I'm going to explain in a stage three in the during your uh, journey of PhD and master rather than just leave it to the last minute. So in stage three, you editing for the accuracy and consistency of the presentations it is uh, usually we call it as a proofreading it's done after the two other stages. Some common uh, problems that we have it in this stage, and we are as an editor and um, evaluator, or we are as a student that putting ourselves as a uh, examiner. Um, so what you are going to look at is about the spelling, punctuations, grammar, and also formatting. That is the final one in the cycle of editing. So while uh, we are editing, we need to editing for the technicalities. Means you are uh, the styles, for example, the consistency is, is, is good when you're writing down the flow and consistency of your writing is good. Is it the styles uh, accurately and consistently apply? So um, um, I wanna just share with you about the technicalities. And I'm sure most of you right now come across that 
because you are you supposed to write the paper or the thesis. So in paper, we call it as the author guidelines. When you want to write in your paper, you need to refer to the author guidelines. And when you want to write in your thesis, you need to go back and check the university thesis style guide. So that one is going to give you some technical information. For example, how do you format the headings and subheadings, numbers, symbols, abbreviations? Is it correct or, um, or not, um, not consistent? <clears throat> so you, you somehow when you are, you know, when you are bringing along some, some statement from other works, you, you might be need to uh, use the italic, the italicizing or the bolding, the consistent, that is another part of your job. Uh, capitalizations, that is another thing. Is it that one is a heading? You need to capitalize that one? Is it correct? Is it consistent? Among other subheadings, among other uh, construct that you have? Punctuations, that is another part Then you need to cross check it. Did you use the commas? Is it doubles, singles? How did you use that kind of things? And the final one is the citations. Did you cross check with the bibliography and reference list? We can find nowadays a lot of citations. They don't have any backup or bibliography at the bottom side of the paper or the thesis. So there is an inconsistency over there. One by one, if you have a list of references, 180, 200, 300 papers in your bibliography and reference list, you need to make sure all of them is linked to your paper or uh, thesis. So the easiest one, Microsoft Word, you can check for the format the size. You can just uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, some modification in your uh, Microsoft Office. That's why I'm saying some students, they are feeling, oh, okay, I'm just uh, patching everything together. And then later on in the uh, final stage, which is uh, the, the uh, proofreading stage, then I'm applying all the styles, all the format, which is to me, I'm saying, it's better in the first step, you program and also modify these kind of things together. And it's helping you systematically writing your chapters uh, sections, headings, cross-reference, putting the images together, uh, tables, and then at the end of the day, you have a very easy life because it's linked to all the program things in the Microsoft Office. If you want to use for the punctuations, other simple sympathies, you, um, um, one of your friends asked me about the Grammarly. Yep, Grammarly is going to help you on those kind of things. Um, uh, also, uh, you, you are using a lot of uh, reference uh, management softwares like EndNote, Mendeley, or whatever. Link it together from the initial stage, from the kickoff uh, stage of your uh, writing. So then you have an easy life when you're drafting your paper. The questions that you might, again, for the stage three you're asking, um, the first one, have you spelling uh, the, uh, the same word in the same way throughout the, your paper or thesis? Why I'm saying that one? Because I can find a lot of inconsistency, especially when those who wants to write it down, uh, English as a second language, the part of the thesis is write it down in, uh, in American English. Another part is the British one, another one, uh, so here. That's why we recommend, here, here the, this is slide is for, uh, for Australia, you can change it to English, uh, British style, Malaysian or, or American, but make sure when you wanna start your writing, you are uh, in terms of spelling, because in American size, uh, even for example, when we are saying them, um, 
some of the things that we are saying Z over there in British is S. And then uh, we can say, uh, we can see a lot of inconsistency when you know, the students is trying to write the chapter by chapter. So uh, consistency from the first day, uh, are you write it out in British, American, Australian, Malaysian, whatever you decide and keep it throughout the thesis writing or the paper writing. Um, because that is another another uh, points, even the reviewer of the paper, pick it up and put it as part of their comments. And another thing uh, is um, subjects and the verbs agree number. Is it this, it somehow you use the single word for the plural uh, subjects and then there is a confusion for the reader when they are reading your say, you say that this building and that building, uh, uh, just using the very single, single verb. But you can see in the, in the context, you have more than one subject. So um, subjects and the verbs should be linked to each other. And um, another one, all participles attached uh, to their subjects means when you want to say the he and she or this and that, uh, is it uh, you uh, link it that one exactly to the subjects when you're saying the he and the starting very long uh, statements with the he is it um, uh, then at the end of the day you just say oh, okay you started with the he but that is a link to the building uh, how did you connect those kind of things together uh, we need to make sure when we are writing those kind of things as an academic uh, writer um another one is uh pronouns uh is it uh, clearly uh to the antecedents um is it the for example as a predecessors or the successors did we use uh and link that one exactly in a true way if you want if you want to just in a simple statements we want to link in something to the another stage in a few years later we need to make sure we link that one uh, with the proper words and the verbs. And this is another thing that is linked to uh, the tense. And the tense um, is very important when you do the writing. Somehow you cannot go to the uh, one tense and then suddenly change that one. It should be a logical reason behind that. So the tense in the writing and the and tense of ver verb is quite important. And then uh, fragmentations, that is common happening because somehow we don't put a complete verb and fragmentations in one statement is happening a lot. That is a, another common uh, issue. Uh, we need to make sure when we are breaking up or breaking down our sections and the um, statements, we have a complete uh, verb for that. So each statement, subject, verb, all those kind of things should be, should be supported very well. And uh, coming back to the reference on the bibliography, all citations should be included and linked to each other. So that, that one is already mentioned to you. Uh, make sure whatever you put as a justification evidence is already linked to your bibliography, to your reference list. And somehow at the end of your thesis or the paper, we can find few citation justification is already not linked. So make sure you, uh, that kind of thing is not happening to your writing. So giving you some tips proofreaders, or you are acting as a proofreader for yourself, uh, is a very critical and highly critical job. Means you are not unwaving your eye for details. So it's not like a reading the newspaper. So you are not, when you are um, on the stage three, your eyes is capturing word by word and editing that one. And errors is always um, happening during the formatting process. 
As I told you, that's why I'm saying don't leave it until the end of your writing. Um, um, to, to us, when we are recommending to our students, we are not saying once you go over all the proofreading in your Microsoft Words or if you are using the Mac in other platforms, it is good you just print the documents. Print the document, check the style, academic style and whatever you have, and then do the final proofreading there. And proofreading, um, you are incorporated all the edits from previous version into the final version. This is another one. Systematic namings of the files. How do you go from the first one to up to the final version? Proofreading the version one, two, three, up to the end. That is another thing that we, uh, in the proofreading is quite important. Who did that one for you? You can put the names because maybe you send it to the few members of your committees and then you need to put it together all, all and don't miss anything. All contents, uh, the confirms uh, with the appropriate side guide, might be some of your, your reviewers, proofreaders, um, changing the side. Make sure you have the platform that is uh, following the author guidelines or university style guide. And um, page numbers, headings, everything is correct in the orders. Uh, you, if you have a line breaks, wider space, you need to put in the wider space for, for any pages. Tables, images uh, correctly and appropriately located with the size that is defined. These are a part of your job and proofreading in, in very general form. The first one is the sense and the style. You need to change, check the, all the word by word, the sense and the style. Another one is the spelling, grammar, and punctuations. So under the stage three, in overall, you check the sense, check the style of your writing, then you go for the spelling, grammar, and punctuations. Always put yourself as a reader's shoe. Uh, so it means uh, that you need to change yourself from the author to become the reader when you want to do the proofreading. Refer back to your university style uh, uh, guide and also uh, and other things that I want to recommend to you. If you're finding uh, um, um, during the um, topic one and two, writing and also editing, we always recommend to you be systematic. Take the one method for your writing, editing, and proofreading. So uh, it means in the, the systematic means take the one line first, put the rulers and, uh, and unwaving your eyes, check that one, go for the next one. And all and all the techniques that I wanna, and tips I want to share with you, uh, reviewers and the proofreaders is always going one word by one word at a time. So because normally when we are reading something as a newspaper, we go for the four words at a time. So you need to make a conscious efforts to stare of each word and then checking that one and going to the next one. So it's, it's not time consuming needs your focus more. <clears throat> so some proofreaders, uh, in order to slow down their review, what they are going to do, they are writing, uh, actually they are piece of writing, they are going backwards. That's why I slow down themselves and checking word by word. That is one of the techniques that they are using. And if you don't know any words, any expressions, any technical terms, what you need to do, just look it up. Just look it up before you just put it there. You want to make sure anything that you want to use your paper or your writing in your thesis, it should be meaningful. And uh, other than that, when you're creating the environment for yourself, it should be very quiet. Don't listen to any music. So it's a very common that students is put in the music. Believe me, you miss it because you need to go word by word. You need to concentrate in a quiet environment, checking word by word, especially when you want to publish your paper in a Q1 and Q2 paper, uh, journals, because you need to be very concise, clear, and coherent 
statements delivering there. You, all the professors around the world, they want to read your paper. So read the um, content aloud to find an, um, longer statements, break it up. If any bad grammar, change it up. Might be the sense is not relevant, change the sense. So these are all the things that are uh, that you can use when you want to do the proofreading. Um, you you just uh, again, if you want to do the proofreading for yourself between the writing and proofreading, uh, absolutely you put the time and the gap. So it means you can go for the writing, then do the editing, then give it a little bit gap, come back to the proofreading. As a conclusion, uh, just um, um, giving you the big picture, uh, middle view, the close up, and these are the things that we cover here. Uh, just um, telling you, um, editing is not something that should be left to the last minute. It's integral part of the ongoing process of your writing. So start it right now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I think I am. Uh, it's a little bit late. Uh, um, I'm, I'm open to any question, anything. Thank you, Dr. Thank, you, thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for your valuable sharing. I hope uh, all of you enjoyed the presentation from Dr. Ali. I'm sure some of you have some questions, but let me ask one of the questions that is still in the chat box. In this from the Muhammad Sarul Islam. He says, yeah. How do you connect one paragraph to the other paragraph easily? How to connect one sentence to I mean, one paragraph or one thing to the other thing? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that is a very good question. So, uh, actually, uh, when you're writing the sections, <clears throat> that section, for example, um, excuse me. <clears throat> That section is talking about, for example, digital design. So um, when you want to link into each other, make sure you, I, I told you about the introductory sentences. Each paragraph should be covering what do you want to say in that paragraph. For example, you are starting with the background of uh, design and then you jump into another one. In another one, you, you need to keep continue whatever you have stated at the previous one and then saying, as the introductory statements, I want to further discussing about a few th theories about whatever I mentioned about. So these are the linkages creating and giving the lo uh, logic and flow for the readers. They know you have started with the background. Then you jump into another section. You want to talk about the theories. That you remember how I told you that if you consider each paragraph as a one leaf of tree, you need to put the spine for that. That the spine is the introductory statements, and it's uh, that one. Somehow we miss it now, and we are starting saying Ali uh, 2021 is mentioned that 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 that. But that that is not a, that is not the introductory. What do you want to say? What do you want to say? Because that one it shows the relationship between the previous one and also the content that you want to cover in the next few lines. Is it? Um, did I uh, cover that one? Yep. Uh, thank you for the uh, good comment. Uh, any other question on the floor? The participant? Maybe the resources to us? Mm -hmm. yes. Anybody? Okay, Dr. Ali, I think. Mm, that's a, that's a yep. Hello, Abu Rahman Zahid. Any question, Abu Rahman? Okay, Dr. Ali, uh, I think. I think uh, uh, we have Dr. Shirin also here. Um, nice to see you again, also, Dr. Shirin uh, here. Sorry, I missed your text here. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, from my end, I like to ask, not really ask a question, I just want to repeat some statement. 
Uh, yep. For myself, for my own experience, I done my PhD in the, I done my PhD in 2020. So I'm purely on qualitative study, right? Which is I, I all my data is very explorative, very fragmented. Say for instance, something like this engage all the information is not fragmented, it's fragmented, all right? So one of the challenges yep. I always find is how to find the logical connection or to make making sense of the data. So these are the yep. common common kind of uh, review from the few data I write to people. Like for even the panels, you say my words are too lengthy. Sometimes I use uh, uh, too many too many explanations. Sometimes it's repetitive. Right? Sometimes also because I have too little evidence. Even I doing a very quantitative explorative study. Because we are all mm -hmm. over here from social science, I believe. I mean more to the yeah. Yeah, physical yeah. So that's yeah. the challenge. So what do you think on that? Yeah, but basically that's why I'm saying uh, we need to know who is our target target participants, and then if you are looking for those uh, participants from the social science uh, background, definitely we can uh, reduce the redundancy of the evidence, and then uh, might be when you want to go for the journal publications. Somehow you want to publish in your journal in the field of landscape, for example, or the design and architecture. You know your target are uh, researchers in that field, and also it might be some architects who are practicing in the in the specific specific field. That you don't need to say too much about some some uh, justification and evidence, and um, might be reducing a little bit about the uh, uh, worthy things and the worthy statements. But my uh, is another strategy nowadays. Everybody wants to publicize their research in the multidisciplinary publication journals. For example, that journals is using the IT participants. IT audience, or might be landscape plus science uh, researchers. Definitely, your writing needs more, uh, more uh, justification and evidence because you need to explain uh, some other things that is some uh, some technical expression that might be is not uh, very familiar with the uh, IT people or might be with the uh, science people. Because uh, you are you want to uh, target the uh, your publication in the field that is quite uh, multidisciplinary. So to me, when we want to targeting, it, that's why I'm saying it is good we discussing with our supervisory committee and also checking who is the audience of our uh, publish work. Is it um, we are going to publish it in the paper that is uh, in the field of engineering? Definitely. That is valid. That is uh, your uh, the, whatever you mentioned because you want to go for the exploratory. You want to go for very qualitative. You need to just give him more elaboration over them. But to me, if you want to go for a very specific journal, which is uh, all the professors and the researchers are familiar with your field, you can omit and uh, make it a. Uh, Make it more simple for them because they already know they have a prior knowledge of that. And if even if you mention in those kind of things, is the drawback and the negative point for them because they are saying you're talking about the facts, you're talking about the clarity. What is the uniqueness behind that? So different strategy, different things uh, in writing, it can be change your your uh, techniques. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Ali. Uh, so I think the rest of, the rest of it. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Ali, for answering these questions. Uh, Thanks for having me here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I was, I was, um, I was, uh, it was my honor to see uh, uh, you, Prof. Raina, Dr. Joy, uh, Dr. Shurin. I think uh, she put something here. Actually, I'm not, um, uh, Dr. Shirin, I'm sorry, I, I'm not quite familiar with the Webex. I, <laughs> I just come across <laughs> your text here. She seriously, that would be so Yes, I'm here. Huh. Hi, uh, <laughs> good to see you here, Dr. Shirin. Yeah, you too. Good talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Yeah, Any other questions? Anything from the flow? I think that's all for the rest of the day. Thank you again, Natali. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm it's a pleasure Adam. to have you here us to share your very good thought. It was my honor. Thank you. I, um, stay you safe, uh, everybody. Yeah, stay safe at the challenging time of pandemics. Hope uh, yeah. to see you again here also in Australia. Yeah. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you to the rest of the attendees. We hope you learn and enjoy the interaction. Uh, I think that's all. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think oh. that's all. Uh, do you know anything? Do the post see. Okay, see you the time. See you coming back to Malaysia. Actually, right now is uh it's very challenging. Um all the borders here closed. Uh, we can do. Uh, we we need to get a permit for traveling. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure about the <laughs> COVID. <laughs> it's very challenging. Yeah, you want us to can't even cross in this state for now on. I mean, like in Kuala Lumpur, Selangor, we are the phase one. We can't even cross yeah. to next states and so on. You will yeah, you're right. about other countries. So I think. One year, two years. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, the the good thing about that when I when I saw your your text, I saw you you are on the board of uh, UPM right now. So good to see you on the board. So hopefully we will catch up with each other um, more and more. So anytime you plan for coming here, just let me know. Definitely, definitely. So uh, Australia is one of my favorite countries. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think there is nothing from the floors. Yeah. Right. Do I need to do anything? So just the stopping the. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.